I was very, very successful at listening to my own song. I'm not trying to ride a dead horse and I'm you know, perfectly happy to go in every different direction. I think being a lawyer uh, or going to law school is an extraordinarily valuable thing. Even though I can tell you I hated every minute of it. When hearing the name Sam Zell, it's almost certain you think of real estate. He started early, teaming up with a frat brother to manage and own hundreds of apartments while studying political science at the University of Michigan. I basically used the four years of, of being an undergraduate to build a real estate business and build other businesses, and I just had a great time. Zell went big into office buildings and then got out by selling Equity Office Properties Trust in 2006 to Blackstone for $39 billion. At the time, it was the biggest leverage buyout ever. It was an easy decision for me, even though it was my baby, it was something I started from scratch. Now, Zell focuses on residential real estate in major urban centers. His over 50 years in the business has him critical of the economic road ahead. Some of the policies uh, uh, implemented uh, of, of flooding the mar market with money uh, are coming back to bite us. That's the typical straight talk Zell is known for. So was the book he wrote a few years ago. He called it, Am I Being Too Subtle? Straight Talk from a Business Rebel. Rarely, I think, does anybody leave a meeting with me and say, what do you think he meant? So as we talk, uh, the economy in the United States seems to be sinking a little bit. Uh, the stock market is not in good shape, I would think people would say, and the real estate market may not be in such wonderful shape. So are you worried now that the economy is heading into a recession? And is that making you feel not so bad because you can buy things at the bottom of the market now? Well, I, I kid people and say that the stock market can't go down because the stock market never goes down when I'm liquid. Uh, but I think liquidity is the theme of what's going on out there. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, some of the policies uh, uh, implemented uh, of, of flooding the mar market with money uh, are coming back to bite us. And uh, I think that uh, we have to reduce that liquidity. Uh, and in, in the process, uh, we've created you know, significant inflation that I think is only uh, controllable by uh, raising interest rates and maybe putting us into a recession. We're not in a recession yet, in your view? No, no. And you've seen this picture before where governments say we're going to raise interest rates, get rid of inflation, but it usually produces either stagflation or a recession. So you think that's likely? Or the Fed chickens out. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, unfortunately, I've only been around this business for 50 years. Uh, but in that 50 years, I've only had one Fed president who ever said and did what he, what he said, and that was Volcker. Uh, every other, you know, Greenspan uh, uh, and all the rest of them have all talked a good game, but when it really came to pressing it, didn't press it. Let's suppose the chairman of the Fed, Jay Powell, called you and said, Sam, you've been around a long time. Uh, what should I do? Should I keep increasing interest rates to get rid of inflation, or should I worry that that will produce a, a recession? What would you advise him to do now? I would advise him right now to raise interest rates significantly. I think that, you know, as, as big as 75 basis points sounds, uh, I think that they could have easily raised interest rates uh, one and a quarter. Uh, I think that, you know, what we have to do is we have to break the inflation mentality. Now we've embedded in people an expectation uh, of inflation uh, that goes into everybody's pricing, goes into everybody's plan, uh, and that's not healthy for the country. So let's talk about your background a moment. So you grew up in Chicago? Yes. And your parents were immigrants from Poland? Yes. So when you grew up, did you say, I want to be the best real estate investor in the world, or what did you want to be when you were little? Well, after I got over wanting to be a fireman, um, I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. And uh, to be honest with you, I didn't really understand what a lawyer did. Uh, but that's 
maybe you know, like there's this classic story about you know the definition of a Jewish boy who is one who can't stand the sight of blood. Uh, in the same manner, I never thought I was remotely interested in medicine, uh, and I figured the law was a, a great card to play, uh, no matter what I ended up doing. So you grew up in Chicago, but you went to University of Michigan, an excellent school. Did you know what you wanted to study there, or what did you want? You wanted to get ready to go to law school, I assume. Yeah, I, and I majored in political science, but I was never an academic, and uh, you know I was always a good enough academic to get from here to there. Uh, so when I wanted to go to law school, I got seven A's, uh, but I didn't get very many A's before that, and uh, and I basically used the four years of, of being an undergraduate to build a real estate business and build other businesses, and I just had a great time. So you were doing some real estate on the side while you were in college, and then you went to University of Michigan Law School, and you, to please your mother or father, you said, I'm going to go to law school, but you weren't that interested in being a lawyer? No, never. As a matter of fact, I ended up you know, graduating and becoming a lawyer, and I practiced for four days. Four days. That's uh, I didn't realize you practiced that long. Four okay. days. Four days. And so in the did... morning of the fifth day, I went to see the senior partner, and as only a 24-year-old could do, I looked at him. I said, "I just don't think this is a good use of my time." <laughs> he said, "Okay, there's the door." No, actually, what he, what he said is, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "I'm just going to go back to doing deals like I did when I was in law school and in the real estate business in Ann Arbor." And so he said, well, why don't you stay here and we'll do the legal work and we'll invest in your deals. And so that's what we did for a year. Okay, so you started building a real estate business, deal by deal, deal by deal. And basically, did you focus on office or industrial or retail? Started in the multifamily sector. And, uh, and I think that, you know, I always had, I, I, I started out thinking that I was gonna be a developer. Uh, I developed a couple of projects and I got cured. And, uh, and decided that, you know, the way to make money in the real estate business and the way to create things was to take on projects that somebody else built, but that the re risk reward for being in the development business, I never saw. As a real estate investor, uh, you were doing quite well, but then you decided to do things outside of real estate. Yeah, I guess your theory was, if I'm good in real estate, I can do non-real estate also? Well, in the early 80s, my partner Bob and I sat down and talked about it. And we, what we really, we really didn't like the, you know, the national commercial real estate market that we had been 100% competing in up until that point. And we basically decided that the reason we had been successful is that we were basically good businessmen and that we understood supply and demand and market share and margins and leverage and and those were all skills that were equally relevant uh, outside of real estate as long as you didn't get to the extreme. So we didn't do rocket engines and we didn't do biotech. But using the standard that whatever we bought, uh, we could t literally run. And that's what we used as a standard uh, allowed us to diversify. And eventually, today, we're probably 70% uh, non-real estate. Uh, versus 100% real estate then. Now, the person you mentioned, Bob, was your partner, Bob Lurie, yeah. who was a, a classmate at University of Michigan? Yes. And he passed away a number of years ago. 1990. And so you kept the business going and you continued to diversify. What would you say is the trait that you and Bob had that enabled you to build this business? Were you smarter than other people, harder working? Um, what was it that you said, I really have this skill that enables me to do this and other people can't quite do it? quite as well. God, I wish I knew the answer to that, David. Well, you must be uh, smart or you but, must be... You know, I, I mean, obviously I'm smart enough. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, I was very, very successful at listening to my own song. Uh, I was very capable of ignoring the noise. Uh, I, the number of times people have told me you don't understand uh, I, I, it's legendary, and yet I was comfortable and had the, the level of self-confidence that allowed me to make the right decisions at the right time. We have an inventory of office space uh, that in some cases is truly obsolete. Uh, so the excess of its existence 
uh, is really a foregone conclusion whether everybody comes back to work or not. The landlords of office buildings are being swamped by a tidal wave of bad news. Work from home may have been replaced by return to office, but 21% of all office visits this year have been for only once a week. In Manhattan, blocks of empty offices in the financial district pushed the supply of available space to 19% in the first quarter, a record high. And when tenants do look for space, the newer buildings are the winners. It's estimated that 30% of U.S. office buildings worth $1.1 trillion are at high risk of becoming obsolete. One oil company's vacant Houston office building sold this year at a $67 million loss to the lenders. By one estimate, prices for newer amenity-filled offices have gained about 15% from pre-pandemic levels, but smaller, older properties are down 20%. We'll learn more over the next few months. Leases accounting for about 11% of the nation's rented office space expire this year. That could pose a threat to landlords and their bankers. In real estate right now, uh, after COVID, many people said, I'm not coming back to the office and I want to work remotely and so forth. Uh, do you think that's going to mean there's going to be less need for office space in the United States compared to what we had before COVID? Or do you think the population is expanding so much so that eventually we're going to need the, the space we have now? The question is too simplistic. Uh, because what we have is we have an inventory of office space uh, that in some cases is truly obsolete. Uh, so the excess of its existence uh, is really a foregone conclusion whether everybody comes back to work or not. And it's indicative of the fact that even in this, what I would call an oversupplied office market across the country, um, the new buildings with the new ventilation, the new everything uh, are filled. And I still feel very strongly that uh, businesses succeed because they eventually figure out how to communicate and how to share risk and how to share ideas better. I don't think you can motivate by modem. And consequently, uh, in every one of our businesses, uh, we've encouraged people back to work and, and in most cases, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're way ahead of everybody else in terms of the number of people coming in. Now, you wrote an article a number of years ago uh, in which you called yourself the grave dancer. Um, what did you mean by the grave dancer? Well, I, you know, in the, in the 70s, uh, I was involved in uh, buying up an enormous amount of distressed real estate. What I really did was I created uh, $3 billion worth of non-recourse debt at a low rate in an inflationary environment. So, in effect, the way we took over all that real estate was, you know, we'd, uh, you know, make a deal with a bank or make a deal with an insurance company. Uh, we'd take over management, we'd stabilize the cash flow, we'd give them a mortgage instrument, which is all they ever wanted, albeit at a lower rate. But, but by creating this gigantic fixed rate pool of capital or a pool of debt, um, when the markets changed and, uh, uh, and when inflation occurred, uh, you know, we saw the devaluation of what that debt occurred and that, that devaluation benefited us. So when you're known as the grave dancer and you show up to buy something or people would say, uh oh, this person is the person who knows how to get the lowest price possible and squeezes me the most, does that hurt you when you're trying to buy something? It ought to. Uh, and, and I think it does initially. But, you know, I think we put on our pants one leg at a time. Uh, we can't extract any more out of anybody. Uh, yes, we suffer from knowing the numbers. And, uh, and so therefore, in a very frothy market, uh, maybe we're, we're tough to make a deal with. Well, let's talk about the most famous real estate deal perhaps you ever did. You built a company called EOP, Equity Office Properties, and you were buying real estate uh, office properties for many, many years. And then somebody came along to you and said, I'd like to buy it, and you weren't really interested in selling. 
and then you ultimately sold it in what is, I think, the highest price ever in one single real estate transaction, about almost $40 billion. So how did that come about, and did, were you interested in selling, and did you know that you would time the market exquisitely so well that you sold it pretty much the day the market topped? Well, I'd love to take credit for that. I don't. Um, I think that uh, philosophically, uh, I've run a whole bunch of public companies. Uh, I've always felt that the day you, quote, take the public's money, uh, there's a definition of who you're obligated to. Uh, when you're investing your own capital in a private situation, you're, in, you're, you're indebted to yourself. The moment you go public, uh, the moment you take in public capital, that's the moment at which the public's interest is what should govern your decisions. And so, as in all of our companies, uh, we do an NAV analysis uh, once a year, twice a year, but we're constantly trying to assess what do we think the assets are worth relative to the stock price. And in the case of Equity Office, we did that on a regular basis. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, somebody came along and uh, offered us a, a number that was materially higher than our NAV. Well, the moment that occurred, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, I had an obligation to find out and you know, see if the price discovery was there. And eventually, uh, uh, we made a deal, and, and that deal was significantly higher than the NAV. And consequently, uh, uh, it was an easy decision for me, even though it was my baby, it was something I started from scratch. Uh, if I wanted to own it forever, I should have kept it private. Your success or your failure is how well you've assessed the barriers to entry. Because if there are no barriers to entry, then you're vulnerable from day one. Now you wrote an autobiography to the effect of, I think it was entitled, Am I Being Subtle Enough for You or something to that effect? Am I Being Too Subtle? Too Subtle, okay. So that's because you're very blunt when you tell people what you think. Um, has that been a problem in getting along in life or actually that's been helpful to you? Well, I don't look at it quite that way. I look at it differently as saying, you know, I, I, I want to be friends with, I want to have relationships with people who respect what I have to say, don't necessarily agree with it. But, you know, and that's why I titled the book, Am I Being Too Subtle? Rarely, I think, does anybody leave a meeting with me and say, what do you think he meant? And so I take a lot of pride in that, in that okay. being the scenario. Sometimes uh, there are people who, you know, aren't real comfortable being, being confronted with reality. So if the President of the United States called you and said, Sam, you're a legendary investor, you have a good feel for the economy, give me some advice about what I could do to make the economy uh, more uh, robust than it is, what would you say? And do you ever get involved with politicians, that kind of advice? Um, not very often, but sometimes. Uh, you know, I mean, if the president called me today, I mean, I, you know, my, you know, my theme is that, uh, you know, we're spending too much time and money on uh, all kinds of things that, uh, you know, we can't afford. And that, uh, you know, the, the, the rules of economics haven't been suspended. And uh, the United States can't continue to run deficits and maintain our standard of living and maintain the supremacy of the dollar. So if um, somebody is watching and says, I want to be the next Sam Zell, I want to be a really smart, successful real estate investor and basically build the kind of business empire of the type you've done, what would you advise them to do? Go to get a good, or her, to get a good education, to work hard, be trained by somebody, have a good mentor? What would you say is the key to kind of building the kind of reputation and record that you have achieved? Isn't the answer all of the above? I advise people, for example, that I think being a lawyer uh, or going to law school is an extraordinarily valuable thing. Even though I can tell you I hated every minute of it, uh, the fact that I've been trained in, in the legal system um, and the fact that 
I live in a world where the legal system uh, is prevalent in everything I do. Uh, I've been, you know, I, I very successfully encourage people to go to law school, even though they have no interest in practicing law. Uh, in the same manner, whatever your specialty, whether it's real estate or something else, uh, you, you got to really be you, you got to really be committed. You got to really understand what's going on. If you were to uh, say well, the best investment advice you've ever been given, what would you say is the best investment advice somebody ever gave you? I think I once, you know, very early in my career, had a had a conversation with somebody about barriers to entry, and I had never really thought of it, but. You know, I understood the fact that gee, a monopoly is better than an oligopoly and certainly better than competition. But I never really understood and put it into fashion. But this conversation I had where he explained to me, you know, when it's all said and done, your success or your failure is how well you've assessed the barriers to entry. Because if there are no barriers to entry, then you're vulnerable from day one. If there are barriers to entry, uh, depending on what they are and how they play out, uh, you can do a much better job of assess assessing the opportunity. In your observation, what is the most common mistake that the average investor makes, selling at the wrong time or buying at the wrong time? I almost can't answer that question without using the word optimism. You know, one of Sam's favorite Samisms is we suffer from knowing the numbers. Um, I think we've managed to... Uh, tip throw to, through the tulips for the last 50 years by never allowing ourselves to get swept up in the enthusiasm of whatever the current event might be. And I think by maintaining that level of discipline, uh, yeah, we've made mistakes, and that's to be expected, but we've, they've all been, quote, controllable. Uh, no one mistake uh, was ever, you know, catastrophic. So when I make a mistake in the investment world, I think about it for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. I never forget it. Are you able to walk away from those things and just go on to the next thing? Um, historically, that's been the case. I mean, I can't help but think about uh, the baseball player that gets paid $30 million a year for getting a hit one out of three times. My job as, in, as an investor is to be right a lot more than that. Uh, but more important, not to be wrong. So I assume when we have cocktail parties again, you will probably go to some. I don't know if you go to cocktail parties. If people have ever come up to you and say, Sam, you're a famous investor. Can you give me any advice? What would you tell that person to do? Uh, I do the best I could to extract myself from the conversation. I can talk generically. I can talk about real estate investment trusts. It's, a, a, I think, a very viable uh, you know, uh, investment opportunity for the average person. Uh, and a lot of other things, but I, I don't ever want to be anybody's guru. So you and I are, you're a couple years older than me, but I've reached the age where people do look at me and say, are you still working this hard? Are you still investing? And I say, yes, this is what I know how to do. Do you get this a uh, lot too? People say, why don't you slow down? Well, everybody says to me, you know, when are you going to retire? I'm sure they ask you that way, the same thing. And I look at them and I say, retire from what? Um, I get up every morning and uh, I read five newspapers and, I, and I'm intrigued by what I'm doing and I'm intrigued by the things that are changing around me and how I need to adjust to what's going on on an ongoing basis. Uh, I consider that to be a blessing.